I'm married to Neil Goldstein. We were high school sweethearts. We moved to Long Beach in 1989, the year after we got married. And we had met in February 25th, 1995. And when he was born, he was the loudest baby in the nursery, letting everyone know that he was there. He came back with us to Long Beach and we've lived here ever since. He, at a young age, was a bit difficult in terms of feeding him. Everyone said it's easy to breastfeed a baby. He seemed to be like wrestling a little gorilla, kind of. He didn't want to latch on. He wanted to have the bottle, the pacifier. And he was someone who was awakened easily by noises and woke up screaming and went to bed screaming. But he was a happy baby and we were thrilled. He was the first grandchild on both sides of the family, the first nephew. So he had a lot of attention. As he went from a little baby to starting to walk, we noticed that he had a lot of difficulty with balance. Everyone kind of used to laugh because he would fall over a lot. And we thought that was a bit different because other kids seem to just walk. And he didn't really have any language or make a lot of sounds when he was very young. We brought him to the pediatrician when he was about 18 months old with some concerns. And luckily we had some friends who knew about early intervention and they recommended that we seek some help because he didn't have the language. His balance seemed to be a bit off. And when he was playing, he seemed to do a lot of repetitive play. So we went to early intervention through Nassau County and they evaluated him and decided he would get home services with physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. And then when he started at home, one of the speech therapists recommended that he went to a center-based program. So when he was two years and eight months old, he went to the School for Language, where they were a language intense program. And that's where his education began. We also, at that point, had him evaluated by the Cody Center, which is part of Stony Brook University Hospital. They didn't want to put a specific label on him because he was still under the age of three. So they kind of came up with um, what they call PDD, NOS, Pervasive De Development Disorder, otherwise specified, not otherwise specified. And he continued his education at School for Language till we moved him over to Variety Preschool which had more of a program for kids who seemed like they were in the autistic spectrum and they had more of an intense program where um, it was a small classroom with TAs and teachers and they did a lot of language-based learning. And that's when at a little over three years old, he started to speak. Most of his speech at the beginning was slow, just a couple words, then he did some sentences. A lot of it was echolalial repeating and at the time when he was younger, he had a lot of repetitive behaviors, a lot of that hand flapping and jumping, and um, had some issues with socialization. When he was turning five, going into kindergarten, he came back to the school district where they had what they called a self-contained classroom, which it was just special ed kids, a special ed teacher, and um, teacher's assistants. And it was the best thing we ever did because the classroom was fantastic and that's when he really started to speak and become more social. And then in first grade, they came up with what they called the inclusion model, where the kids were mainstreamed with special ed and regular ed kids in the same classroom. It was the first time they ever had that in not only Nassau County, but they were developing that. Back then, though, the school district had no children, if it's possible to believe, labeled autistic. They labeled them everything else. They labeled them other health impaired. So we were like the first people to actually get the diagnosis. And, and it, would you say that that's, back then the, the word autism wasn't used as much as it is nowadays? Absolutely not. They didn't, no one spoke about autism. People didn't 
know about autism. Sure. First grade inclusion, which was at the time like new and no one knew about it. And it turned out to be a fantastic model because they put mainstream kids in the class with a special ed and a regular ed teacher and they had TAs and the kids that they put in the model were like role models. And from there, um, Matt's development just started to pick up more language, started to read um, and socialize with the other children. And then when he continued through elementary school, this inclusion model with the special ed and regular ed teacher always in the classroom continued with him and the other students. When he was transitioning from elementary school to middle school, as a family, we decided that Matt should have a one-on-one -on -one aid because middle school, you move from class to class and the school district was not in favor of it at the time. And I thought considering that he was gonna to have to go from classroom to classroom, a lot of transitions, it would be the best thing. And it turned out it was the best thing. He had wonderful one-on-one -on -one TAs that worked with him from middle school, and then that continued all the way up through his junior year of high school. So going back to, uh, I guess, middle school, when there was a special ed teacher or trained person in the classroom, why that, that was not mandated by law? That's just what the district was doing? It wasn't mandated by law to have the person in the classroom full time, but because Matt came into that model when it first came out, that's how they developed the model in the Long Beach School District with the full-time special ed teacher, a full-time regular ed teacher, teacher's assistants in the classroom, and the about eight students special ed and the rest of the students regular education students. You feel that was a good thing? It was fantastic. I was very different than the rest of the population of the school. So I was, I was developing disabled and a lot of kids were normal. So what happened was, I was it was hard for me to fit in a lot because they were like, who's this kid here? I was, I was looked at weirdly sometimes. But then they started, they knew I had someone, like a person next to me, like especially during middle school time. They, they saw that I had someone next to me. I would, I, and then all of a sudden they said, that kid must have a developmental disability. We should be friendly towards him. And a lot of kids respected it a lot. I even had friends who were not even from disabilities, they had who were normal. And what happened was, I, got, I started to make made a lot of friends in the middle school. Kids respected me, and even even when I did something wrong, sometimes they would say, "Say, listen, I have a learning disability. I have autism. I do things I'm not supposed to be doing." But then they said, "Okay, I'm sorry about that. That it was mean to you. I was, didn't mean that. But you have a learning disability. I should ex accept that." It's very unfortunate today. A lot of kids in schools get bullied by developmental kids get bullied by normal kids because they think they just take advantage of them, but I don't think that's cool. Because in my sense, there was a kid who bullied me back in sixth grade, and then we became friends. Like towards the end, we, he started to realize I'm bullying the wrong kid here, and we became friends and, like towards like, the second half of sixth grade. Then in seventh grade, we kind of broke apart here, but at going on going on through high school, it was a little bit, it was harder at high school than it was in middle school because high school, there was more kids that were bigger there, there was fights, there was a lot of did you get bullied in high school? I got bullied a little bit sometimes. I mean, I, I did start to see a social worker more often. Well, because there was no time in high school. I think it was my freshman year. During the second half, that special ed teacher who I really looked up to left the bill. So what happened was I got very upset. I was starting not to like really, I was starting to act up in classes. And I was starting to not behave myself because I was upset that that special ed teacher who was helping me get through stuff was not, was not there for me. And... This was before all those laws of bullying went to effect. A lot of kids started to like start to pick up, pick on me there, then and there, and I was then I started to see a counselor in the high school because we I did see a social worker in middle school and elementary school. But what happens in middle school? We we didn't really like the social worker who was there, so we stopped seeing him. I was seeing a counselor on the outside, but then in high school, freshman year, second half, we started seeing I started seeing a counselor more often on a daily basis because of because I was getting upset by some things, especially if I liked a special a girl particularly. I sometimes I do something sometimes that wasn't right. And the girl would get very upset and get scared and she would go even go to like the administration to report it and luckily they stepped in, they say they said, 
that Matt has learned this ability he did not know better. But luckily, I was able to get a service that I saw a counselor on a daily basis from the second half of freshman year all the way to my senior year of high school. And it pays off. And I still see a counselor at college today. So let's go back to high school or middle school. What are some of the, your favorite things to do, either in class or, or your hobbies? I know you're involved in sports and you sing. Tell me a little bit about things you like. I love singing. I was in the chorus from sixth grade all the way till senior year of high school. And I love playing sports. I joined the Long Beach Tiger Shark swim team when I was in seventh grade. And then I joined then in ninth grade. I joined the high school swim team under Woody Davis, who was the greatest swim coach of all time. And then in then I joined the track and field team in freshman year. And then and then after then all, in junior year, I joined the cross country team in high school. And then continued to my senior year. And I did I did swim team and track all the way into my senior year too. And I really enjoyed doing those sports. I made some friends. The coaches were very understanding to me for my learning disability, because actually I was the first kid from the special ed program to go on to the swim team and go on be in the chorus, in the high school chorus. And I was basically the first guy, the first kid they ever had in the history of the school district to be on the, be on the party athletics who had a learning disability. They never had that before, which was like a big historic mark for the school district's athletic department and for the music program in the high school which was like huge because they, they said, wow, I've never seen someone like this before. It's basically the coaches were very understandable. And if I had, they couldn't go to practice or something, they would understand me. And I really liked it. They under, and they worked well with me. They worked one-on-one. -on -one. And if I ever had a problem, sometimes and high, the first, the first year, the swim team was hard because it was like, I'd never been on a high school sport. It's a big deal. It was a little bit of adversity, but you know, I said to myself, I tried. I pushed through, I got over to adversity, and I overcame it. And I did well the last couple of years of my high school career up to the point in my junior year where I didn't even need a TA to be with me. After senior year, I was all by myself, and I survived. Wow. And, and tell me about college. What are you studying at college? And what do you want to be? What do you want to do? I'm currently studying professional liberal studies. I want to go into the entertainment industry, like hospitality. I want to work at places like Madison Square Garden, the Barclays Center. MetLife Stadium, I want to work at hotels, maybe even get a job on Z100, that local radio station in New York City, and I also want to go, and I really want to go into the entertainment business, like work, maybe work in Times Square, work on those tour buses that go around, because I'm very good, I'm really into maps, I'm a map person, I collect maps everywhere I go, I love looking at maps, I love reading maps, and maybe I might get a job at Google Maps, maybe, I can possibly, or like, or wherever, because I know a lot of maps are going digital, so maybe Google Maps would love to have someone like me who's very, who knows a lot. I'm very good at giving directions to people, because I have two friends of mine who have no sense of direction, and if they're with me, I'll tell, show them where to go, I lead them the right way, and they appreciate it. You know, Matt, um, what would you say to parents who are either have a child who is newly diagnosed, or who are just a little overwhelmed and don't, don't know what to do? Sure, I would say for parents who have children that they think that there's something going on and they don't know what to do, first of all, follow your instinct. Because when Matt was little and I saw that something was a little off, a lot of people said, oh, he'll grow out of it, his speech will get better, don't even worry about it. And my instinct was, this is, something's not right. Something's not right and we need to find out where to get help. So you get as much help as you possibly can and also expose your children to as much as you can. Don't, because they have a disability, don't have them sit in the house all day. We took Matt everywhere. We took him traveling to all different countries, states. He always came to the supermarket, to grandma's house, to every single occasion. And we also made sure he was involved in everything. He was on t-ball, he was in soccer, swim team, boy scouts. He actually, he made Eagle Scout when he turned 18 and it's just a matter of don't accept that your kids has limits just because they have a disability. Harvey always says focus on when they, what they can do. Absolutely. Not what they can't do. Absolutely. So I want to ask Matt sort of the same question. If you were, imagine that instead of talking to me, you're talking to, you know, a third grader who has some special needs issues um, 
and they just don't know how they're going to get by, um, what would you say? I would expose them to the world outside them. I would take them to like fun places like bowling, take them roller skating, take them swimming at the pool, have them go running on the boardwalk, take them to the beach, go take them to New York City. Because I have a friend who lives out east who has the same issues I have, who has autism, who has never visited the city ever. And you live right on Long Island and you have the best transportation that can take you right to the city. And you should take advantage of that, especially if you're a kid who has autism. You should see the sights of New York, travel the, you know, around the United States, travel the world, explore your, expand your, your horizons. Because you only live once in life to see these things. Because you only have one life. And if you don't get to see these things, you'll miss out. You'll say, why did I do this? And when you're, especially when you're an older person, you say, why did I see the city? Why did I do this? And especially if you have a learning disability, you should definitely explore more things. Go to con I go to concerts all the time. I go to, I see a lot, I, I go to like Broadway shows. I'm into, a, I'm very fascinated by a lot of things. And I should definitely take kids who have learned disabilities out to these places. So, so if you, that's great. That's a great answer. So if you were speaking to that young person and saying, well, let, let's go, I want to take you to some of these places. And the young person were to say, well, gee, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'll get pushed around or I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not good at things or I have, I'm different. What would you say to them? I would say what FDR used to say. There's nothing to fear but fear itself. Because you shouldn't be afraid of it first. At first, it's a little scary. It can be scary first, but you get used to it. It's not as bad as you think. As long as you use your street smarts, keep your eyes wary of what's going on, and trust your instincts. Trust what's going on. You gotta learn in this world who your friend is, who's not your friend. That's why I'm starting to figure out, now I'm getting older, I'm starting to point out who, which person really is, has my best interest, who does not have my best interest.